between the government of Barbados and the government of China overall. I'm going to speak more broadly, Mr. President, under the theme rural transformation because anyone who knows the Scotland district area, Mr. President, knows that we are talking about rural areas, beautiful, spectacular rural Barbados and what is necessary in that area, Mr. President. And then I'm going to be speaking a little bit about some of the pressing issues that have been raised by persons at different times on different issues relating to this, Mr. President. But I want to start first by putting into context why a Barbados Labour Party administration would undertake to take to do work of this nature. Mr. President, in 20, 2018, when we faced the electorate, we set out a manifesto at the time that we continued in 2022. And I want to begin by speaking, first of all, to our 2018 message, which focused on infrastructural transformation. By 2018, we came to office and under the umbrella of road, report, road repairs and road transformation, we inherited a government, Mr. President, and a country where no significant transformational capital works projects had been undertaken for over 10 years for on our road infrastructure. We had any number of reasons why, Mr. President, challenges relating to unavailability of credit, challenges relating to the high debt rate, I believe the, the debt to GDP ratio when we came into office was 179% of GDP. We are now, Mr. President, for the record, and I will come to that a little later, at somewhere in the vicinity of 129% of GDP, notwithstanding the concerns that have been raised in some quarters about debt accumulation. And Mr. President, we found ourselves in a situation where despite a high debt to GDP ratio, and despite all of the expenditure that we were seeing in various areas, we were still faced with things that were considered by some to be transitory inconveniences, things like potholes. Mr. President, we were, found, we were finding ourselves in a situation where all of our major roads were in difficulty and we found ourselves whether on Highway 7, Highway 1, Highway 2A, or even on the main ABC Highway, unable to traverse the length and breadth of the country without having potential damage to our vehicles. Now, Mr. President, I use those examples as publicly traversed roads in commonly used areas. And if those were the areas that were problematic, Mr. President, you would imagine what rural Barbados would have faced on secondary roads which were less traveled. Mr. President, all across the Scotland district, all across Barbados, all across the countryside of Barbados, our road infrastructure has been and has continued in a state of disrepair. It is on this basis, Mr. President, that in 2018, this administration gave a commitment to address that in a transformational way. Mr. President, it is on that basis that in 2022, when we came to office again, Mr. President, on a second occasion, that we made a determination to push even further with road rehabilitation projects. And so, Mr. President, under the Scotland District Road Rehabilitation Project, you now have a comprehensive road transformation project that treats to a stretch of road from stretch of, of road rehabilitation from Beulah in St. Philip all the way to St. Andrew and everything in between. In 2022 of May of 2022, Mr. President, you had a condition of roads survey completed by this administration under this particular project. And this was completed to look at a stretch of 188 kilometers of road. And then we went to have a further 35.1 kilometers of road, in this case, specifically from Beulah to St. Philip to Sand Pit in St. Andrew. And these roads were identified for the purpose of repair, reconstruction, and to have them upgraded where appropriate, Mr. President. And it is on that basis, Mr. President, that under the loan arrangement, the first step that this administration undertook along with the Exim Bank was to have a detailed scope of works review, to have the design work completed, or at least started in some instances as the roads were identified, and to have a detailed bill of quantities. This was a requirement that we followed and we ensured that we had the bills of quantities, Mr. President, that would allow for us to ensure that that which was costed 
was that which was designed and that the prices we were paid are the prices that we were being charged and that it was fitting and within the scope of works. So Mr. President, so far quite a bit has started and we were hoping that some of the remedial work would have begun by the 1st of June, but as was indicated by the leader of government business in the other place, who also serves as Minister of Transportation and Works and therefore responsible for uh, this particular project, that things will happen in the scope of redesigning and finalization that will affect the start date. But that notwithstanding, Mr. President, there are a number of roads that have been identified. The first road that have been identified as a sample road is Shori Village. That road is to be milled and paved. The second sample road, Mr. President, is Vaughn's Road number two. That road is to be milled and paved. The third one is Barnes Road number one, and that is a reconstruction of that road infrastructure. The same thing applies to Surinam Road and Cotton Tower that are all earmarked for reconstruction. Highway three, Mr. President, running from Bonwell Junction to Gags Hill, that is to be milled and paved. And then, Mr. President, the biggie. Over the last several years, the area at White Hill, has been badly affected. I believe the Member of Parliament for St. Andrew would have spoken in great detail about the anguish of the people and the families that live in that area and what they have endured. And what struck me as he was speaking, Mr. President, was that he was making reference to a church there that has been closed for many, many years and people who have been unable to attend that church. Mr. President, that my last name is Cummins, and that church is run by a woman called Evangelist Seraline Cummins, my mother-in-law, or my former mother-in-law. And I've gone to church there on many, 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 many years. For many, many years, I have had fish cake, fries cake, cake, and we call it bake sales to raise funds to do the rehabilitation of that church, to build that church, Mr. President. And so... It is personal to many of us in many different ways because I remember many a Sunday driving from my home, going to White Hill, going to Harvest, quarterly services where every church from rural Barbados under the United Pentecostal Church Assemblies of God would come from Shuri Village, from Crab Hill, from all of the areas and they would assemble at the White Hill Church for quarterly services. That has not been able to happen for many, many years. And I say without question that the people who have invested in the families who have invested in their community church at White Hill, which is replicated by the parent church in Orange Hill, that they would be looking forward to having the people who have grown up and lived in that community for many, many years and have given their hearts to service in that church community, that they would also welcome the rehabilitation of the road at White Hill that would allow the people who live down the hill to once more be able to come up the hill to fellowship with their community and the people from all across St. Andrew, St. Joseph, and as far as St. Lucy, Mr. President. So the White Hill Rehabilitation is critical, not just for road rehabilitation, not just for the people whose houses are literally slipping and experiencing land slippage, but it's also important for community to encourage and to participate in their normal activities. I mean, you can't go to church. You can't walk from one part of the community to the next. Those are things that people experience over the last few years, and for them it is intensely personal. So I don't want to make this about a $256 million loan that is over 20 years, because these are the facts as well. The loan is meant to last for 20 years. There is a five-year grace period. The interest rate for this loan is 2%. The only interest rate that is lower in terms of debt, at access to debt, is IMF loans, which is 1%. Uh, and so these are the facts of the loan. Mr. President, these are the technical specifications of the loans. But the impact of what the loans will be used for, if I were to use the language of some of my colleagues, really is about the, of how it affects the day-to-day -day lives of the people who live in the Scotland district area, Mr. President. And in, and in a broader sense, that then includes the St. Joseph, St. Thomas, St. Andrew areas in particular. Now, Mr. President, let us also be very realistic about what we're dealing with here. 
I don't think that any of us here have grown up in a Barbados where we do not recall land slippage in the Scotland district area. I don't think any of us have grown up in an era, in an era where we do not recall dealing with houses slipping or roads becoming impassable. We've all experienced that. Mr. President, just recently in, in my role as the Minister with, responsibil with the Responsibility for Tourism, we were interacting with the concessionaire for Parsons Cave. And right there in Welchmill Hall Gully, a $10 million investment for the expansion of the areas around the Welchmill Hall Gully, Mr. President, have been impacted by the engineering challenges that the entire central parts of the country in Barbados face. The fact that most of the rock is limestone, and most of the rock is prone to slippage, and it makes what would have been a $1 investment a $10 investment because of the depth that you oftentimes have to go to and the engineering around it. And so that, Mr. President, is also a factor, as was articulated by the Minister with Responsibility for Transport and Works in the other place, in the management of this project, and there are going to be those times, Mr. President, where you will see some changes in the actual execution of the project on the basis of what the engineers may find. Mr. President, also included in the work that we are dealing with here, Mr. President, is the question of the rehabilitation of bridges, gabions, and those kinds of things. That is also critical. Under the provisions that are here within the loan, Mr. President, we also have to look at the bridges that are in that entire area. And there are more bridges than some of us can count. They too have to be rehabilitated. And so we're pleased that the work at Bodens has begun. We are pleased that the demolition work has been done, has been undertaken, and that the work to allow for the temporary bridge to be put in place is underway. Whether notwithstanding, we're today dealing with and yesterday dealing with, and we are in the hurricane season, and so we expect that there will be some interruptions to the roadworks as a consequence of weather, uh, the issues beyond our control. But we give the commitment as a government, Mr. President, that rural Barbados must benefit from a complete rehabilitation of the road infrastructure that allows them to traverse and to undertake the normal day-to-day -day tasks that everyone else all across this country is able to participate in. You should not have difficulties, Mr. President, going from school to work to home on a day-to-day -day basis in an environment where you are unable to travel comfortably. Whether you're traveling by car or you're walking or you're on a bicycle or a motorcycle, Mr. President, it is important for us to be able to do this. But I want to put this in context, Mr. President, because we live in a real world. The realities of where we are right now are not what we would like them to be. And so if I want to buy a home today, Mr. President, I don't know who in here, but I can say I am not in a position to go into my bank account and to pick up cash and to go and buy the property that I may want without having to face the bank. There is always going to be debt of some kind for the purpose of investment and transformation. If I want to, if I have bought my house, Mr. President, and I have decided that my family has expanded and I want to be able to have two more children, that is not true. But if I want to be able to have a few more children and I want to expand my family and I need a few more bedrooms and a few more bathrooms, Mr. President, I, like most Barbadians, cannot look into my bank account and say, let me pick up that money and go and use it. The Barbadian way, Mr. President, is to do bit by bit if you can't afford to face the bank. You get a little money here, you add on a little bit there. You get a little money there, you do some there. There are some in here who may be able to do it all at once, but not all of us. And then there are those, Mr. President, who face the bank, who may not have enough to be able to say to the bank, this is what I need, because they may not have an income that is guaranteed, and so they have to be able to save to get it done. And then there are those, Mr. President, who have to face the bank for debt, and they have to repay on a monthly basis. The government of Barbados is no different. 
The government of Barbados does not have a bank account that is sitting there waiting for that they can go and pick up and say, here, I want to build the roads that my people deserve. And I simultaneously want to take the money that my people, that my people are asking me for to provide social services, Mr. President. This is an administration that while we have reduced the debt to GDP ratio from 179% as at 2018 to 129% as at 2022 and falling, Mr. President, I believe the number that we are looking at at this stage, let me just make certain because I wrote it down earlier today and I want to make sure that I am precise. Mr. President, the debt as we see it now today is at was in going into the I'm correct 127 percent of GDP, Mr. President. I don't know how more simply I can put this than to say that a government that has had a debt restructuring, domestic and international, a government that has had a pandemic that has increased our spending while slashing our revenue. A government that has simultaneously had to expend our, ex our, our, our commitments on education and health care in the last four years or so, Mr. President, and has had the largest social welfare budget that we could remember in modern times, Mr. President, that simultaneously we are undertaking at the same time to ensure that our infrastructure lends itself to comfortable living for our people, Mr. President. And you know, sometimes... You know, many of us are parents, and we try to explain to our children that money don't grow up on trees. We try to explain to our children that we can do everything all at once. We can do a little bit here, and as much as we can, we will help, and we will do this, and we will go to the next stage a little later on. We have to help our people at the same time to understand that, and I heard an honorable member speak on a different bill earlier today to say, Healthcare is not free at the point of delivery. Nothing is free at the point of delivery. Everything has a cost. It either has to be paid for at the point of delivery or it has to be paid for by taxation or alternately, and sometimes it has to be paid for by debt and the debt paid for by different means, including recovery of taxes from citizens and from companies. The things we want have a cost. The things we deserve have a cost. The things we desire for our nation have a cost. And the government of Barbados is committed to ensuring that we manage those costs responsibly. And the expectation, Mr. President, is that all things being equal, that over the life cycle of this loan, that the government of Barbados will be able to return to a primary surplus that the government of Barbados will also be in a position to return to a growth trajectory. And I want to speak for a few moments about that, Mr. President, because the growth trajectory is critical to the discussion. I want to speak, Mr. President, also for a moment about the question of labor, because we have seen some queries being raised about Chinese labor under the Exim Bank loan and whether Barbadian and Barbadian contractors will have an opportunity. Mr. President, inbuilt into the contract is a provision that requires 80% of all labor to be procured from Barbados. 80% of all labor is local and that is contractual, Mr. President. That will include Barbadian subcontractors in terms of construction companies as well as Barbadian laborers. 20% of Chinese labor is allowed, and that 20% is largely at the managerial level to be able to oversee the project, to be able to ensure that their procurement rules are being adhered to. But 80% in any language is always going to be significantly greater than 20%, and that is enshrined in the contract. Now, I know that there are also some queries that have been raised by Barbadians as well about what this means for us and our ability to repay. And I want to speak to that for a few moments, Mr. President. Mr. President, let's take a look outward before we come back to Barbados. Mr. President, Prime Minister has been talking about in every forum, and I feel as though sometimes when we listen to some of the commentary that Barbados is you know, on a different planet system than the rest of the world. Prime Minister has been speaking about the COVID pandemic. Every single economy in the world, bar none, has been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have had subsequently, 
I'm not even talking about the hurricane and the ash fall. I'll put that on the, on the side because we had to do what we had to do. But Mr. President, the war in Ukraine does not affect our day-to-day -day lives. We don't see it. We don't feel it. It's not next door. They're not shopping malls. Sheraton is not getting a bomb being dropped on it like happened in Kiev two days ago. We're not seeing that. So we think it's some abstract thing that doesn't really affect us. And sometimes people who should know better say things that you start to wonder if they actually do. Mr. President, Ukraine produces enough food to feed about 400 million people globally. 400 million people. It produces about 50% of all sunflower oil globally. It produces about 10% of the world's grain supply and about 30% of the world's corn supply. Simple things like baby formula went off the shelves a few weeks ago in the United States. Why did it go off the shelf in the United States? Because the basic inputs for production were not available internationally. There's an article that I was reading, Mr. President, which spoke about the impact of the war in Ukraine on the globe and how it was affecting different economies, Mr. President. And one of the things that it said in the article, and it was an article by, I believe it was the World Economic Forum. In the World Economic Forum article, it said, Mr. President, that the impact of the war in Ukraine was going to reverberate across every region of the world. And it would affect the regions of the world in two principal areas. One, food prices and access to food prices and commodity prices as a result of increasing fuel prices, Mr. President. It spoke also about the impact on inflationary rates, inflation rates and what, that would, what impact that would have on prices in every single economy. It went on, Mr. President, to speak as well about the fact that while the Latin America and the Caribbean region did not have a trading relationship in any substantial way with either Russia or Ukraine, that the impact of sanctions on those countries was going to push the price of fuel up in a way that the Latin America and the Caribbean region was going to be among the most affected regions of the world in terms of inflationary prices. Mr. President, the prices that we are facing, all of us here in Barbados, are not a manufactured outcome of government policy. Neither, neither are they the result of mismanagement of government policy. It is a global reality that is being borne out, not by me and my voice here in Senate, but on Bloomberg, on CNN, on BBC, on Al Jazeera, on NBC, on Fox, every single news station around the world. When you turn your TV on, you will see what is happening globally. And Barbados is a part of a globalized community, and therefore the impact is very much here with us. But that does not mean that we as a government are going to ignore the cries of our people and what they are dealing with. But it also doesn't mean, Mr. President, that we are going to, and I think someone said this to me many, many years ago, the problem with y'all as a government, y'all's made this thing look too easy. That's what they said, y'all's made this thing look too easy. So when you actually start to tell people what is happening, you're complaining. <laughs> it is not that, Mr. President. We have, in many ways, made it look too easy, but it has not been, Mr. President. And the decisions that are being made by the government to press ahead with a comprehensive road transformation project, a comprehensive rural transformation project, an aggressive social reform and transformation program, Mr. President, that goes further than has been done by most administrations previously, Mr. President, to look at the institutional, the systemic, and the infrastructural challenges facing our social transformation, our, our social sectors, Mr. President, is, a, is an indication of a government who's committed to its people. A government, Mr. President, who is committed to ensuring that we can support. We in this house, Mr. President, a few weeks ago, I believe it was, passed a resolution vesting in a special purpose vehicle, the St. Joseph, what we then call the St. Joseph Hospital, to ensure that we could support the University of the West Indies, a government that has already ensured that we commit to educating every single Barbadian that applies to and is accepted at the University of the West Indies. A government, Mr. President, that cares is not a government, that does not care, I should say, is not a government 
that is going to make sure that simultaneous to all that we're dealing with, that our healthcare system is getting the benefit of a significant investment, Mr. President. A government that has undertaken as well to review the overall cost of health care, as one of our government senators, our, our, our members of the Senate said earlier today, it has a cost. It has a cost. And the monies have to come from somewhere in a government where revenues have plummeted because of conditions that are not of our own making but are global in nature and origin. Expenditure has, has soared as a result of circumstances that are also not of our own making but have to be managed and still simultaneously is projecting where Barbados is now relative to where Barbados needs to go next. Because we have to assume that today will not always be, that tomorrow must come, and that there has to be hope and inspiration, and that in time to come, within the course of the life cycle of these loans, that Barbados will recover along with the rest of the international community, and that the aspirations that we have and our people have are able to be financed, and that our growth trajectory is able to service our debts, and that within a given time frame, we are in a position to, one, repay our debts on time, two, to deliver on the ambitions of our people, three, to deliver a level of growth that is sustainable and is transformational, to be able to treat to every single productive sector that is the revenue earning sector, to be able to grow at a rate and at a diversified level that then in turn allows us to achieve an overall level of growth that in turn, Mr. President, is able to finance our ambitious social transformation programs because you have to be able to pay our bills in order to take care of our people, especially our most vulnerable in our community. There are going to be those, Mr. President, especially those who live in the rural areas, who will have to benefit from road rehabilitation programs, who will also have the benefit of being able to start new businesses, who will also be able to see the economic development that comes from infrastructural transformation. Because once you start to see infrastructural transformation evolve, social and economic benefits accrue in those areas where you have that transformation. Now, Mr. President, I want to close my remarks on the establishment of a Scotland District Authority. Now, a few years ago, I believe it was in 2019, I had the honor of delivering the Dame Ermie Bourne Memorial Lecture, the inaugural Dame Ermie Bourne Memorial Lecture. And at that time, I recall having had the opportunity to sit with the late Right Honorable Owen Alfa in preparation for that speech. And he said, of the things that he said to me, this was the one thing he said that made, that was most important. He said to me, Lisa, the last thing I did before we left office in 2008 was to pass the Scotland District Authority Bill to establish a mechanism that would focus attention by the government of Barbados in a series of diversely spread agencies across the apparatus of government to bring them together into a single authority to treat to the management of and the development of the entire Scotland district area. This administration has given the commitment as well that we are also going to be looking to finish that work which was started all the way back and end, ended in 2008 when we left office last and then was now brought back in 2019, 2018, once we returned to office. It was one of his last wishes. In my one of, one of those conversations with him in preparation for the Dame Ermie Bourne lecture. And I do happen to know that this administration is working at the level of the various ministries, in particular the ministry with responsibility for agriculture and rural development to ensure that once more, to treat to the Scotland district area in a comprehensive way that allows for the entrepreneurial development of its people, the environmental and infrastructure transformation to take place in that region as well, driven by a road rehabilitation project that we have 
before us in this resolution, Mr. President, and then ultimately the creation of new opportunities for new centers of excellence and clusters to emerge in different parts of the country. There is no reason, Mr. President, why a Warren's industrial district, why an Oyston's, you have Martins Bay evolving in St. John as well, there is no reason why there cannot be an appropriately established ecotourism or eco-friendly cluster of businesses that evolves in the bottom, in the, bos in the bosom of the Scotland district area. One that respects the ecological heritage of the region, of the area, yes, but one that also allows the people of the area to benefit from the provision of services using a cluster-driven model under the umbrella of a revamped and a reinvigorated Scotland District Authority. Mr. President, in closing, I just want to close, I, I just want to make mention finally, again, of the roads that are going to be covered. Shuri Village, Vaughan's Road number two, Vaughan's Road number one, Suriname Road, Cotton Tower, Highway three. But I want to say those with the understanding that this is just the beginning. These are just the roads that have been identified, and I use the word sample roads. These are the sample roads that have been developed. Once these roads have been developed, and you have done the mill and pave or the reconstruction, as the need, as the case may be, depending on which road it is, you will then see the further identification of additional roads. And with those additional roads, you would have had the lessons learned from White Hill and from the roads that I have, I have identified already to say, this works, that doesn't work. This is suitable for the area. We have had success doing it this way, but we didn't really do it well in that way, so we need to pivot. And so it will allow us to have a second wave of road rehabilitation projects in the Scotland district area, having learned from the best practices established on your first outing with the sample roads, Mr. President. And so on that basis, we just want to take this time to give the people of the Scotland District area the assurance that this administration is committed to bringing you the development and the transformation which you deserve. We are committing to this loan $256 million because we believe that Barbados is going to be placed on a trajectory with all the other related measures that are being put on the table, Mr. President has spoken about in different fora, to allow us to repay this and every other loan, Mr. President. 2% versus 1% from the ID, from the Intermarket, from the, from the IMF, International Monetary Fund. Mr. President, these are concessional rates, and I want to close by saying this, Mr. President. If we, Barbados, are able to attract concessional funding at 2%, at 1%, suggesting therefore that there are those who have confidence in Barbados. Why would I not have confidence in us? If others have confidence in our ability, our ability to repay, our ability to manage, our ability to evolve and to develop, I can say here without fear of reproach, Mr. President, that I am not in the business of second guessing myself. I am not in the business of having low self-confidence and we as a people here in Barbados must never allow the psyche to evolve in Barbados that we cannot do those things that we set our minds to. We have confidence in ourselves, Mr. President. This government has confidence in Barbados. We have confidence in the management of Barbados under our leadership. We have confidence in those who are working with us to provide resources, and we have confidence in our people who are walking this road with us. And we share that confidence with all the international creditors who are also ensuring that they make it very clear in public spaces that they have confidence in Barbados to meet the standards that we set for itself, ourselves. And on that basis, Mr. President, I wish to beg to move, I beg to move that this resolution do now pass. Thank you, Senator Cummins. Any speakers? Senator Dr. Rogers. Senator Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I rise just to say a few brief words on this resolution because it is one that 
touches a topic very dear to me. The last time I spoke in here, it was June 1st when I mentioned that that would have been my first day at school in Barbados in 1987 when I came to the island. And when I came to Barbados, my dad, who was a priest in the Anglican Church, was stationed at Cane Garden in St. Andrew at the churches of St. Saviors and St. Simons. So I know very well of the woes of the Scotland district. Senator Cummins would have mentioned the last few years, but I can say the last few decades. Because you just needed one good rainfall and your entire route will change for the day. When it wasn't that the Springvale Road was impassable, if you tried Chalky Mount, you had a problem there. Dark Hole was a similar problem. And I dare say that it is the Scotland District that helped me to develop my work ethic where church is concerned because my dad, when he was stationed at St. Simon's, we realized that there was a part of the congregation that could not get to church because the Turner's Hall Road was gone. And so we then had to leave St. Simon's, sometimes after 11, going 12 in the morning, to head up to Turner's Hall to have a little service in the school there, just to keep that part of the congregation together. And then we would come down White Hill and head home. But then White Hill soon went, and then everything fell apart. So it was a common theme in that part of the world that the roads were just not well, not good. And it is a good thing that we are embarking on this comprehensive program to fix some of these roads. I was glad to hear the mention of the White Hill Road, but we also have lots of others that need some work in that area. And as Senator Cummings would have pointed out, this is just a start, and I'm hoping that we can stick to this to see for those people in that part of the country. You see, it is very easy, if you do not live in that area, to simply talk about the pandemic and the economic challenges and so on. Those are things added to the woes that they face every single day and have faced every single day for the last few decades. You buy a car and you Sometimes you can't even park it at home because the road is down. You have to park it somewhere to walk across a little track to get home. The, you catch the bus, you have to walk with all your goods because the road is down. You have to go to get home. And that, that is a common thing for them, added to their water woes and everything. So I support this bill 100%. Yes, they, it is an economic burden on the country, but it is one worth taking because I do recall when we were drafting the Charter of Barbados last year, one of the lines that was placed in that charter was that every generation is indebted to the generations that went before it and obligated to the generations that will follow. What we're doing today is not simply for us. Recognize that what we experience in this country at this time, others made sacrifices in the past, that we can experience these things. Now is our time to make sacrifices for generations to come. And I wish to commend the government, even in the midst of everything that is happening, to think about those people in the Scotland district and, what, and the woes that they face in terms of transport and their roadworks to take on this work even at this time when there's so many other things that are pressing. But I believe that for the people in the Scotland district, this is very good news. And I hope that everything comes to fruition and that these projects will run smoothly for the betterment of the lives of those people. And, with those few words, I thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Senator Reverend Dr. Rogers. Senator Dr. Braffy. Mr. President, <coughs> I 
I rise in support of this bill to invest in the road infrastructure in the Scotland district. Because I believe that this investment should be the beginning of the creation of a new economic space for the people of St. Andrew, St. Joseph, and St. John in particular, and the people of Barbados in general. There are two facets of this initiative and potential future wealth that I would like to underscore. The first has to do with rural tourism. And the second has to do with food security and response to climate change. Mr. President, the Scotland district, which represents one seventh of the total area of Barbados, demonstrates once again that Barbados is geologically unique. According to UNESCO documents, the district is the summit of an elongated submarine mountain range, several miles long, that stretches from Trinidad in the south to Puerto Rico in the north. It is therefore a unique geological site, being the only part of the mountain range that is above water. The district has rock formations that are reported to be over 50 million years old. And the formation of clay stones, chalk, and volcanic ash is unique in our country. It was considered by UNESCO in 2005 and is part of a tentative list of World Heritage Sites. According to UNESCO, Barbados also has an amazing array of sedimentary rock formations, and I quote, geological structures consisting of mobile material that was forced into more brittle surrounding rocks, usually by the upward flow of material from a parent stratum, and the largest of which is the subsurface of the Scotland district. The highest elevation of Barbados, Mount Hillaby, is in the Scotland district, 340 meters above sea level. Although small by comparison to some of the volcanoes in the islands of the Les Antilles, Mount Hillaby, within the Scotland district, is the summit of an elongated submarine mountain range that is several hundred miles long, extending from Trinidad to Puerto Rico. The overall shape of the Scotland district is that of a round bowl cut in half by the Atlantic Ocean that borders along the straight east coast with sandy beaches and dunes. Mr. President, the Scotland district, end of quote. Mr. President, the Scotland district is the heart of the beauty of the east coast and is therefore yet another gem in our heritage tourism package. In addition to Harrison Cave, the site can be yet another site of heritage tourism and a geological wonder of the world. Mr. President, the second reason for supporting this bill is because the Scotland district, an area of some 14,000 acres, has the potential to be the tropical fruit orchard of Barbados and could assist in achieving the national goal of planting a million trees in our country. In fact, given the fact that the average mature tree occupies about 400 square feet, we could plant 1,583,988 1, trees in the Scotland district. Tropical fruit orchards, mangoes, avocados, guavas, soursop, breadfruit, coconut, and Barbados cherry could be planted in the Scotland district area 
and industry could be developed around these fruits, and we could develop an industry based on the production of fruit concentrates that could serve to replace those that we currently import. In the tourism industry, there is need to promote use of local fruits and vegetables in menu options, and local fruit and juices such as mango, tamarind, golden apple, soursop should be readily available in our hotels and restaurants throughout this country. The nutritional value of local fruits and juices should be an important incentive to grow these trees in the Scotland district. Research has shown, for example, that the Barbados cherry contains 100 times as much vitamin C as an ordinary orange. The fruit also contains antioxidants and other health-promoting ingredients. Herb gardens can also be produced and provided for in this area, and the area is excellent location for the preservation of our biodiversity. The industry would provide employment opportunities, and the trees planted would not only help to stabilize the soils of the area, but also help Barbados to comply with its commitment under the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Mr. President, you will no doubt recall that Barbados, in its nationally determined contribution, communicated the United Nations Framework Convention, pledged to achieve an economy-wide reduction of greenhouse gases emissions of 44% compared to its business-as-usual situation. The current government, in 2018, committed even further to transition in this country to be a 100% green carbon neutral island state in the world by 2030. The planting of trees in the Scotland district could contribute to the achievement of this goal. In summary, Mr. President, I see this bill as the beginning of a new era in the development of the Scotland district, and I hope that the next phase in the development will be a project that recognizes the true touristic and entrepreneurial value of this site and one that will not only promote it as a heritage site, but will develop entrepreneurship and agribusiness opportunities for the people of the area. I hope, therefore, that the proposed project will extend to incorporate a project that promotes the increased production of tropical fruits for better nutrition and for reducing the incidence of chronic non economical diseases. It will promote the production of medicinal plants for herbal medicines, herbal teas, herbal creams, herbal oils, and herbal tonics. For example, Moringa. To produce more wood for furniture, building materials and souvenirs, promote the development of nurseries, promote more agro-industries based on the production and processing of local fruits, into local juices and other beverages, provide for additional tree management services, promote ecotourism, heritage tourism, and community tourism based on natural heritage and the green spaces for birds, for bees, and for butterflies, contribute to the regeneration and the stabilization of the soils of the area. Mr. President, I thank you for your indulgence. Thank you very much, Senator Dr. Graffin. Um, Senator Herewood. Thank you very much for recognizing me, Mr. President. Mr. President, I raise with the full intention of giving support to this resolution. I think it is a very important resolution which captures not only the intention of the government to invest a significant proportion of funds into the Scotland district, but also a push by the government to level the playing field and to bring residents of that particular area on, um, a, on a footing of a high level of dignity with regards to access to their, to their, their areas. Mr. President, I know the resolution focuses on Barbados and the Scotland district, but I must reflect, with your permission, briefly on a few visits that I made across the region. Um, if I may, 
began with Grenada last week, Thursday, when I was down there observing the most interesting occasion, drinking water and minding my own business, of course. Um, but I had the privilege, Mr. President, to visit an area called Molinier. And this is the area that is in the constituency of St. George's Northwest, the constituency of the former president, former prime minister, Keith Mitchell. And Molinier is an area that experienced significant landslides over the years, the last being in 2021. And I happened to be down there in 2020 because it's on the highway right off from where they have the underwater, where there's the underwater sculptures as well, the marine protected area. And we were just driving and all of a sudden a huge chunk of mud came straight across the highway. And the highway is not reinforced with gabion barriers. It's just a simple wall separating that huge land, land mass of mud from the sea right next to it as well. And I want to bring that to the attention of the Honorable House to give consideration to the fact that this landslide issue, one of the issues in terms of landslides, is not unique to Barbados, although it will come back to the specific issue at hand, but also the financing behind it. At that specific time in 2020, Grenada had well over 140 occurrences, some major, some minor, of landslides all across the island. And the government was basically scrambling to find resources to address this particular issue. As it stands today, the contract has been awarded for the repairs at Molinier. Um, the contract is a relation between, is a bilateral between the government of Grenada and the UK through the Inter-American Development Bank. And interestingly enough, most of the materials for the project is coming from the United Kingdom. Interestingly, but not surprising. I also had the liberty, Mr. President, of going a bit further south. And I visited Guyana as well um, over the weekend. And I took a trip to Linden. And Linden in July 2020 had a massive, massive downpour, uh, torrential downpour down there. And quite different from Grenada, um, you're not going to see much rocks in that area. It is pure mud, in fact, pretty much almost all across Guyana. So the intervention that they used to address the issue was quite interesting. The residents got there before the, the government, and the residents helped to dig some trenches, reinforced by the traditional Dutch, impro Dutch improvisions in the area as well, and tried to get the water going back out to the, going back out to the sea. Now, they also used something which is interesting, not necessarily gabions, not these big heavy boulders, some geotextile um, materials, which is a material that has a spider web like kind of look. And what it does, it, what it does, it restricts the movement of mud whilst allowing the water to flow through the, the actual structures as well. I don't want to get too technical, but just let me highlight some issues which may not be too far from home, although they're in Guyana, that can be replicated here. The issue of cost, of course. As a result of these landslides, it costed significant amounts of money for persons to take shortcuts and, you know, you're taking shortcuts, so you're spending more on gas, of course. And then you wear and tear on the vehicles because they were not structured roads that were taking shortcuts on as well. So whether it be tires, whether it be the, the, the chassis, um, the suspension, walking as well. Walking is good for you, but sometimes the distances that persons had to walk was unbelievable, particularly in the area of Molinier. Um, and in Grenada, I have a saying, you're either walking up, up a hill or down a hill no matter where you're going. And in most instances, it is really unbearable. I heard Senator Brathwaite just mentioned the UNFCCC national determined contributions that we're obligated to submit. And one of the issues that we face in terms of landslides and the diversions as well, which use more gas, is the contribution to greater greenhouse gas emissions as well. Because as a result of diverting, you have to obviously go along tracks and what used to be one mile turns into three miles and you're contributing more to global warming as well. But I don't want to get too technical. Let me fly back to Barbados as I did on Sunday. And here we are today discussing the resolution, 250 million or so um, dollars to facilitate the road rehabilitation program. It is not a fly by the night exercise. I, I suspect everyone recognizes that this is on page eight of the estimates under the um, operations of government in terms of expenditure. And it is really no surprise. We know the air represents a seventh of the northeast of the island. 
As Senator Bradford quite rightfully said, in terms of its UNESCO um, recognition, it covers a stretch from Puerto Rico all the way down to Trinidad, and we are fortunate in terms of the recognition to have the highest peak along that stretch. But I also recognize that land slippage in that area is nothing new. As far back as 1901, and persons recognize it as the Bosque Belt land slip, it had a significant movement of materials in the area, up to 10 million cubic, cubic meters, about 50 football fields or so. That was that was prone to land slippage in the area. We also had more recent times in 2016, El Nino and La Nina in terms of the excessive heat, which caused the sediments in the soil to crumble a bit, and, and that area was at risk in terms of land slippage. La Nina, obviously, excess rain, and that in itself causes a bit of land slippage as well. But I want to support this resolution because it is a resolution that supports the development of infrastructure um, in the Scotland district. It is a resolution that supports the advancements of economic activity, but more importantly, it is a resolution that supports the improved livelihoods for persons in the area. Now, Minister Cummins quite rightfully identified six or so roads um, that were identified. I had the liberty this morning of getting here on time still, but taking a short trip um, through the Scotland district with the members, some members of the Ministry of Transport and Works, and I want to commend them for allowing me the prerequisite of observing in specificity some of the areas that are challenges. So I may repeat a few names, but Mr. President, let me list, I think this is about 23 roads or so, or more, you can count with me, because I want senators to understand the volume of the intervention that's being made. So we're looking at Trio Path, Troya. Well, I said Trio, potato, potato, but I appreciate that. St. Simons, King Street, Shorey Village, Babylon Road, Turner's Hall, Moe's Bottom is almost like a song, yeah? Hillaby, Bloomsbury, Melvin's Hill, Highway 3, Tent Bay, Suriname Road, Vaughan's Road 1 and 2, as Minister Cummings said. Ermeybourne Highway, Martins Bay, Welch Village, Glen Burnie, and Ridge Road, to name a few, because that is not all the roads, like the side roads that come off as well. So I want to commend the, the, the staff at the Ministry of Transport and Works for facilitating my very late request to have a better appreciation as to the situation up in there as well. Mr. President, I want to focus on the potential benefits because one thing that is missing from this exercise, I am a government senator, but I am one that is very honest, is a cost-benefit analysis. So whereas we are speaking about the quantitative aspects of the expenditure, there has been limited discussion apart from down to brass stats in terms of the quantitative returns from the exercise. And that is something that can be addressed by a cost-benefit analysis. And it is not a sharp falling of the government to not have one, because we cannot sit or stand here and ask the government to do a cost-benefit analysis and then do the intervention based on that. These things take time. And the most important aspect of a cost-benefit analysis, in this case, is not, is not going to come from the government sitting in isolation and deciding what activities can be done to bring in foreign exchange or, or economic activity. It is done as a participatory exercise so that persons in the area and outside of the area can tell us what they think are viable economic activity for the area. As far back as 19, I believe it was 1993, former Prime Minister Oinansas, um in another place, he actually called, he requested on people in the private sector and individuals to submit proposals on what can be done in the Scotland district. And he asked them to formally submit it. Again, I am not in cabinet, but I believe that we have a government that is receptive enough that if anyone within an earshot through you, Mr. President, has ideas in terms of how we can bring economic activity into the Scotland district, that they can make in haste in terms of communication to the relevant authorities as well. If we get that information, and if the government gets that information, that forms the qualitative and quantitative basis of a cost-benefit analysis, because now we can say, yes, it costs 250 million, but based on these activities, it may be able to rake in X, Y, and Z. Mr. President, I want to touch just three specific points in terms of the benefits, though. Although these are not quantified, they're general, and I, and I suspect many other members of this House can support the likelihood of them being um, good activity in the area. Agriculture, as one, Senator Bradford touched on this. And the Scotland District is a very sensitive area. And in sensitive areas such as this, when we talk about agriculture, we need to be careful as well. 
because not every agricultural practice in the area will have a long-term benefit to the area in terms of its ge geological um, structure. We can talk about aquaponics, something that has minimal impact on the actual environment down there. And I just want to, I just want to un underscore as well how significant the issue is of agriculture and targeted agriculture. Back in 1966, in November, when we declared independence, the residents of Mellows District were contemplating with the government, and they were very, very upset. They were saying that they wanted to move out of the area, and they wanted to move out of Mellows, not because they wanted to move out of Mellows because there were animals grazing on the flatlands, the pastures in the area. And why they wanted to move wasn't because of the cow's manure, but because of the grazing is going to lead to a lot of the root structure, the grasses that hold up the, hold up the, the, the dirt and stuff in the area as well. So they feared, they feared that they were at risk in terms of their livelihoods, as, as simple as that may sound. And that just underscores the fact that, yes, agriculture for the area is good, but targeted agriculture, agricultural practices, sorry. The second one is really ecotourism, and the Minister of Tourism spoke to it um, as she did with the best authority. And this speaks to allowing persons who have an interest in, in ecotourism who come from outside the island or within the island as well um, to have an appreciation for what stands there in the Scotland district as well. The third one that I want to speak on is environmental. And I believe in this area, and this is environmental in terms of revenue generation, in this area is very unique. And there are so many different financing modalities that we need to explore in terms of generating revenue to, to, to treat the environmental practices in Barbados. I believe that we can give consideration to a cap and trade agreement similar to what Guyana has done and they're doing. And they signed, meaning Guyana, the government of Guyana signed a memorandum of understanding in 2009 with the government of Norway through a cap and trade agreement to the tune of 250 million US dollars. And it is a simple agreement. You in Guyana basically ensure that you conserve your forests and you can generate what they call carbon credits. And then you can sell those carbon credits to another country um, that is emitting, the, that, is, that is undertaking activities that have carbon emissions. So as to kind of balance the offtake and on-take in terms of carbon emissions as well. And this means that while countries are polluting, you are absorbing the equivalence of that pollution someplace else as well. Imagine the landscape, imagine the number of trees that he just mentioned, uh, sorry, that Senator Bradford just mentioned, Mr. President, that we can plant there, that we can generate carbon credits for, and simply sit back and conserve the area, absorb carbon credits by trading them, and that is a, that is a general revenue stream that is a fraction of the cost in terms of management. So that is one thing I want to mention. Another thing that I want to mention is the jobs. And Senator Cummings touched on this and gave great clarity, so it will not overextend this area. But the provision of jobs through the project, 80, 20% split between those non-Barbadian and those Barbadian um, residents as well. I think this will add significantly to them, not only being masons and carpenters and stuff in the area, but I really would like to advise further that the interventions in terms of the job market as capacity to those persons to understand the environmental impacts of the area and not just come there and build, a, build not just come there and throw a rock in a Gabian structure and, and think that that is really targeted employment. I think we need to look at more developmental ways of getting our skills persons to not only come and add a pebble but understand the structure of the pebble, where the pebble is being put there. Suffice it to say, a subsequent intervention like this, if we take that approach, um, it means that we can be in a better position to offer the technical expertise to bump that intervention to maybe 95 to 5 percent in terms of local to um, foreign as well. So, Mr. President, I want to say basically that this is not only about $250 million. This is not only about the litany of roads that are going to be repaved. This is about a dignified approach to ensuring that persons in those areas have access to infrastructure, proper infrastructure, similar to other persons in this country. And with those few words, Mr. President, I want to support the government in its initiative and this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Hayward. Senator Drakes. Thank you, 
Mr. President. Sir, I am heartened to hear some of the interventions thus far in relation to the resolution before the House, because as has been mentioned, uh, there has been some public angst around this particular loan, uh, the size of the loan, and in some instances, the source of the loan, which is unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> so I will ignore the assignments. <laughs> but, but, Mr. President, what is clear is the discomfort and the angst that is coming from the public. Although the government may have the requisite information, they may have the cost-benefit analysis, that is not something that the, the public is privy to in any comprehensive way. And in having that blind spot in relation to the, the, the breadth of information that the government has, I would implore the government to have more meaningful dialogue around the benefits of this project because if it is a case that, as we've heard today, there are a number of, of roads that are being identified, uh, a number of, of private projects that, that can then come from that rehabilitation project, then I think a comprehensive communication package, something along the lines where Barbadians are then given more information about what is the, the vision for the Scotland district, which, is a, which this loan is a component of. But Mr. President, I really want to also talk a little bit about where we are in terms of our debt. And to say that a lot of the issues that we've had to grapple with recently, there was a, a defining moment in 2008, as we all know, in relation to the economic crisis. And because we were unable to grow the economy to spur significant economic activity. We then had a, another somewhat defining moment in 2016. Because, Mr. President, from 2008, our debt was $6.8 billion. The GDP, our gross domestic product, was $9.5 billion. And you can say that that was a relatively good position in terms of the debt to GDP ratio, 71%. So, and since then, without any serious intervention, we have hovered around the $9 billion mark in terms of economic activity here in Barbados. In that 10 year span, and you've probably heard this um, numerous, on numerous occasions, from 2008 to 2018, the debt ballooned from $6.8 billion to $12 billion, being cognizant that gross domestic product just stagnated at $9 billion. So what that did was then place pressure on our foreign reserves, as we know. In 2016, as I said, was another defining moment because that is when our import cover for, from, since 2008, for the first time, fell below the two months uh, import cover in terms of foreign exchange. <laughs> in, and that, sir, presented then the challenges that the government is grappling with in terms of having to restructure the debt in 2018, 2019. Whether you agree with, with, with how that was done, that was a course of action taken. But sir, in 2018, our gross domestic product just finally passed the $10 billion mark. So in light of the restructuring that happened, anyone who was watching and monitoring just the numbers, just the plain numbers alone, would have marked that, yes, there was an improvement happening in the country. But sir, as we know, we spoke about it this morning in the earlier debate, the pandemic happened and we had to incur more debt to deal with the ballooning demand for expenditure. So when we look at having to restructure the debt, incurring debt 
due to the pandemic related expenses and others. Very little actually has changed in relation to the aggregate debt stock or the total debt stock that Barbados has. So in 2016, our debt was $13.3 billion. Our debt last year, based on the Central Bank's report, was $13.3 billion. So although, yes, we have a set of funds allocated for all of the right reasons, if you just look at the numbers, there is cause, there would be a cause for concern in the public domain. Because if it is a case that the pandemic has been so severe in terms of the amount of money we've had to borrow in such a short space of time, then any additional financing that the government has not fully ventilated would seem like it is a cause for concern. Mr. President, the leader of government business, when the honorable member spoke, said, you know, we have to provide hope and tomorrow must come. And I agree. But as a small open economy, there are things by which we should be cautiously optimistic about. And I understand that government is trying to mount a platform by which we take on or incur debt based on a particular growth trajectory. But the, the level of uncertainty, Mr. President, that is now happening in the international or the global economy is unprecedented. Mr. President, internationally, some experts are warning that a global recession later this year is imminent. That is the way the cookie is crumbling for us. We have Mr. Jamie Diamond, of C the CEO of JP Morgan, talking about an economic hurricane is coming. When persons in those types of positions say that they're being conservative with their balance sheets, Mr. President, and you take that into consideration along with the amount of debt that we already have, the few areas we currently have to grow the economy, to be faced with another financial shock, if it comes, it is cause for worry. It is. Mr. President, our major source markets in terms of tourism, the UK, they are also going through their own issues. And these are not even issues that are based on finance, but these are not, we are talking about social tensions and social unrest in terms of, the, of labor rising up and demanding their fair share in terms of the strikes that are happening now in the UK. And we have to take these things on board when we are planning, Mr. President. And for me, we have to consider all economic scenarios. Mr. President, we are entering into a season where we have increasing interest rates because of the move by the Federal Reserve in the US, where they increase the, the interest rates by, 70, by a quarter of a percentage point recently. Three quarters of a percentage point, sorry. And that is going to have significant impact on the cost of borrowing, the cost of investing. And the aim of that, Mr. President, is to curb the inflationary pressure that currently exists in the commodities market. But, Mr. President, this is why people are saying a recession is imminent. When you increase the interest rates to dampen demand, in the traditional economic sense, prices are supposed to go down. But Mr. President, the inflation that we are incurring right now 
is due to supply chain issues. It is a supply side issue. So on one hand, you have prices increasing, interest rates increasing, demand being dampened, and nobody can tell you, Mr. President, how this is all going to come out in the wash. Because it's an economic paradox. The, 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 theory, the theories around this type of policy making, where the, the, the current variables are, it is, they're not supposed to be here. And that is because of the, the continued economic shocks that the economy continues to face, Mr. President. So when we say that Barbados will be able to service the loans, Barbados is going to be on a growth trajectory, I am optimistically cautious about that language. Because remember, we never recovered from the 2008 crisis. And the amount of shocks that have come and have devastated the Barbadian economy in two and a half, three years, it is going to be a significant undertaking to manage our immediate affairs as well as service loans. And on top of that, Mr. President, we also have, and this is by no means saying that the government should not embark on debt sustainability, a government that is trying to rein back in fiscal deficits, which in and of itself also continues to dampen economic activity because that policy measure pulls money out of the economy. Sir, so the angst, I think, is justified if given the full gambit of information there may be some quelling in relation to, you know, taking on this, this $256 million. But the question around, and I, and I sympathize and I understand the plight of those living in that area. But when you're talking about a situation where you could be faced with food shortages, you could be faced with persons going hungry in an economy. People find it hard to justify road rehabilitation. And at this level of debt, Mr. President, and I, and, I, and I really wanted to make that intervention. Mr. President, I want to, a number of things have been said, and I, I won't go over them. But I want to speak to the schedule that is attached to the, to the resolution. Mr. President, I am a member of this chamber, and we've heard bits and pieces as well about the contract and the agreement. Mr. President, given the level of public discourse, given that at present Barbadians are saddled with on aggregate total, $13.3 billion in debt per population, per capita, that's about $50,000 per person. If the government is intended to take on these types of debt financing facilities, we should be able to see the agreement. We should be able to see the contract. And that in and of itself propels us towards saying, yes, we are a mature republic and democracy. But isn't that what this whole program is about? This whole project around exercising and demonstrating, Mr. President, that we are moving towards governance that is more transparent, it is in a more mature state, and we can ventilate very easily in black and white based on what the agreement and the terms and conditions are outside of just a grace period and the disbursement. Because we have, yes, a grace period 60 months from the effective date of the agreement. Disbursements, 48 months from the effective date of the agreement. But I have no idea what the agreement is. Mr. President, what is even of more concern to me when I read the resolution, 
and the schedule, and the accompanying schedule. This contract or agreement, the laws that govern this agreement are the laws of China. That is what it states in the schedule. The laws governing this agreement are governed by the laws of China. And this has nothing to do with being skeptical or there's anything untoward happening. But we just celebrated being a republic. We want to demonstrate that we are moving towards a mature democracy. What are the laws, Mr. President, that govern this arrangement? What are the specific laws? Which laws? Barbados has a, a gamut of laws. Which laws? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which laws. And Mr. President, the final question that I would have to ask is what are the terms and conditions if Barbados defaults on this loan in relation to the laws of China? What, what, what happens in that arrangement? Because we've heard about how great the loan is, how much time we have to repay, but what happens, what are the terms and conditions when we default on the loan? Mr. President, people will think that this is a joke. And persons, the average persons on the street take offense when an administration or government comes across very dismissive because you've been given the mandate. So if we come and we ask a question, Mr. President, being our representatives, being the ones going to sign off on these loans, and if you're saying to me the laws of China govern a quarter of a billion dollars in debt, you should be able to come and tell me what those laws are, what are the specificities, and in particular, what happens, Mr. President, if we default on this loan or any other loan in relation to this loan? Because that is how the debt restructuring is, 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 is outlined. Our external creditors said, we will only restructure the debt and you will make the savings only if you do not renege on any other debt. So is this not even tied to other loans in terms of the terms and conditions? And these are the things that we should know. Because, Mr. President, we have to pay it back. It is not the 30 members downstairs and the other place. We all have to pay it back. We all in this together, Mr. President. So let us all have a mature conversation. If there is public angst about the debt that we are incurring, Mr. President, we should, be ha we should have available information comprehensively, and the government should be able to respond to the questions that are being posed because there's a concern about the level of debt in Barbados, along with all of the other economic troubles that are projected to come our way. Mr. President, I'm obliged to you. Thank you very much, Senator Jake. Senator Paris. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to support the resolution before this honorable chamber. And in her presentation, the leader of government business would have said that this is a manifesto pledge of the Barbados Labor Party in its 2018 and 22 manifesto. And it is no secret that the Barbados Labour Party honors its manifesto pledges. And we are here this afternoon to debate this so that we can honor yet another of our manifesto pledges. This aggressive roadworks program by this government also demonstrates its commitment to the country and to its people. Mr. President, the $256 million being spent on the rehabilitation of the Scotland district is the largest amount spent in a specific area for rehabilitation. The money will be used to repair roads and bridges, and these are roads and bridges that were not done for 60 years. I want to repeat it, sir. 
There are roads and bridges that were not done for 60 years. Mr. President, I have visited White Hill on numerous occasions and have heard the cries of the residents for help. I saw what they had to endure on a daily basis just to live their normal lives, to get in and out of the district. For them, just walking outside and putting your trash in the cans, it is not normal. We can do it because we have good roads, but these people in White Hill have suffered over the years. They now have to take their bags of garbage to the nearest, and I talk about taking as in having to walk with them to garbage cans outside of their districts. Um, the SSA trucks cannot drive to their homes because there are no roads. The BLP listened to them and saw their plight. And they were assured that if we become, when we become the government, we would give them better conditions. And that is why we are in this chamber today debating this. For persons taking drives to Martins Bay, Consett Bay, and other areas, their driving skills are tested. They have to maneuver through rough roads. Sometimes they have to stop and go to an alternate route. And it causes wear and tear as well to their vehicles. Mr. President, I am supporting this resolution, knowing that this is going to bring relief to thousands of people living in the Scotland district, ending years of suffering and giving them the opportunity to experience some of the things that persons not living in these districts in Barbados can experience. They no longer would have to walk with two pairs of shoes. No longer would these residents have to park their cars and walk to their homes because the road is impassable. No longer would they have to fear the fact that if they have an emergency in their, it, at their homes in the night and they have to call an ambulance or if a fire truck has to come, that they cannot get close to their house. Mr. President, over the years, businesses, were impacted by the lack of road repairs in the Scotland district. I am sure you would have heard the cries from some of the business owners of popular businesses who were affected because people were not able to get to their business. In some instances, they had to close the business. When the roads are completed, Mr. President, persons would now be able to go back to these watering holes and support these businesses. With the work being undertaken, the Scotland district, the, in the Scotland district, job opportunities will be given. We heard that it's an 80-20, 80% of Barbadians will get jobs. And again, this is going to help the economy and the persons, the businesses in the area who normally, the small shops who normally open on weekends and sell their chicken and pork, these same persons who are working in these districts where the project is being done will benefit from them as well. Mr. President, persons, residents who were using public transport had some inconvenience. The buses had to drop them sometimes a long way from their homes, and they had to walk with heavy packages. If they're coming from the supermarket or whatever, they had to walk with these in their hands. The transport board had to adjust its Shorey Village route to accommodate commuters. The broken bridge stopped the Shorey Village bus from going into Lakes and Baxter's and a shuttle 
had to be created. Residents in White Hill also had the benefit of using the chateau. But today, presently, this road that is used by this chateau is getting smaller and smaller. So this road rehabilitation project is timely. Mr. Pre President, I look forward to completion of these roads in Scotland District. But I would also like to use this opportunity to make an appeal to the Ministry of Transport, Works and Water Resources to work closely with the utility companies and avoid having to dig up the roads soon after the work is completed. Wherever possible, I am asking them to identify the areas that would need major works and work at coordinating so that we will not have to do repaving as soon as the work is completed. It is, an it is an inconvenience to road users, but it is also considered to be a waste of money and time. Mr. President, I would like to see the Ministry of Transport, Works and Water Resources give consideration to ensuring an effective public relations program to inform the residents and road users of the work being undertaken, when and where. They should work closely with the residents to prepare them for as to what to expect when the project has started. Yes, the residents will be prepared for some inconvenience, but I do believe that they would have a better understanding in knowing what to expect if there are proper communication to them, if there's proper communication to them. Tell them about the dust that would come with this project and also put plans in place to minimize the dust because we have residents living in these areas who suffer from asthma and from allergies, and also make an effort to ensure that the dust is kept to a minimum. I think communication on this program is of importance to this project. Mr. President, signage in the Scotland District needs urgent attention, and again, I am urging the Ministry of Transport, Works and Water Resources to give attention to repairs of this signage. As you drive through the Scotland District, you see broken signboards, rusty signboards, signboards covered with um, bush. It is very difficult for road users to depend on these signs to assist them in finding their way, especially if they are not familiar with the road. I am asking again, Mr. President, for consideration to be given urgently to implement a sign maintenance program to address the issues identified. This would make it easier and safer for road users to traverse in the countryside. Mr. President, in closing, I would like to commend the economic team for negotiating this loan that saves the country a considerable amount of money, while at the same time resolving a long, long outstanding problem for the residents living in the Scotland district. Mr. President, with those few words, I am obliged to you. Thank you very much, Senator Paris. Senator Kevin Morse. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I trust and hope that my apologies were conveyed for my absence this morning. I keenly wanted to be here, but I was in the other, other place. They, they were indeed. Yes, sir. So my apologies to you and my fellow members. Sir, I did not plan to interject in the proceedings this evening, but I felt compelled to by the quality of submissions and to even some extent inspired by the nature of the asides which were thrust forth to any comment that was made that sought to even query. I, I somehow did not hear any. I, oh, I well, you have that unique privilege, Mr. President. I am not so special. And I thought to myself that let me lend a voice, a voice that says the government is doing the governing, and the Senate has no power <laughs> on money bills. However, it does have the right, as is currently composed, sir, under the Constitution, to comment. And on this basis, I shall so proceed. Now, Mr. President, it might be a little known fact that I am of the North, for the North, and come from the North, sir. Mile and a quarter, sir, is where my family derived from, sir. And while we are discussing the Northeast, the Northeast, Mr. President, I do feel a kindred spirit which myself and my friend Senator Andrea Boyce would share, having derived from the plantation in that region, sir. And sir, now, we look at it from the perspective of what is being done, and we see the benefits that have been laid out. For my part, sir, this is certainly in keeping with the developmental push, and from what I have heard, sir, it sounds like a promise made that is going to be a promise kept, Mr. President. Yes. And sir, we have heard the benefits, the attendant local tourism push. Hopefully it would make the efforts with regard to the water a bit easier, and we know the government has been pushing in that regard. It should certainly ease what we're coined as transitory inconveniences, sir. And I actually looked that up as a legally defined term and allow for the better passage of us as citizens of the country to the Northeast to enjoy the beauty and splendor that surrounds that region. And of sir, we must also consider, besides the aesthetic value, the stimulus to the economy of the injection of this money into the contractors, the subsidiaries, even the workers who would be working on these projects. Now, of course, with everything, some idealists might say, well, which companies will benefit, sir? Do we have checks and balances with regard to the procurement process, sir? Do we have fair play to ensure that these companies themselves are doing what is a condition to take part in the bidding? But that's not the topic of the discussion today, sir. There are clear benefits to what is being proposed. In that regard, Mr. President, while there are benefits, as a Section 34 or 35 senator, I believe is the correct constitutional reference, we like to highlight different perspectives with regard to the benefits and what are the concerns that have been echoed. Now, for my part, Mr. President, I received the token when I entered, reflecting on the fact that we are celebrating 45 years of diplomatic relationship with the People's Republic of China, sir. And certainly, the loan being provided by the Export-Import Bank falls in line with a policy which has seen that China has become the biggest lender of credit in the world, sir. Biggest lender of credit. So the entity, when we peruse the legislation, sir, is stated to be the Export-Import Bank of China, sir. This is stated, when you do the research, sir, as a government development bank which provides loans 
guarantees, settlements, deposits, financial consultancy, and other bank-related services for export enterprises. And I think that persons who have concern should be reminded that we have previously borrowed from this entity in a form or fashion $170 million for the Sam Lords project, a project that is nearing its climax, and I'm sure to see all members in attendance as we celebrate. And I think a point should be made, sir, that it is a sign of a mature government it is a sign of a mature and reasonable government that whence it was in the past that projects started by one administration were maybe not as eagerly embraced. That we see the Sam Lawrence project being taken within the bosom of the development of the government policy, sir. And that is to be commended. So, sir, I say to those who have fears that, well, there was money borrowed from this entity before. And I've heard the commentary with regard to the rate that is now 2%, and we must think about the confidence that is had with the economy and commend the economic advisors. And I think I would like to echo those sentiments. However, when we borrowed the $170 million back in 2017, I believe it was, or 2016, the rate was 2.5%. Now, Mr. President, you would know the difference of BSE's points, so I will leave that with you. But it is a better interest rate, sir. It is a better interest rate, sir, and it shows the development and how the government is mature in terms of the financing, and we are moving forward. Does it reflect the confidence? Let us see what it says. It, however, I don't think anyone could argue with a 2% rate of interest. Now, when we examine the legislation which governs these type of loans, sir, the Special Loans Act, and how it has moved over the years, sir, we see that the money borrowed is charged on the general reserves and assets of Barbados. I was speaking to a colleague of mine, and I have received some guidance that that means reference to the consolidated fund. However, sir, the statement is that is a charge on the general reserves and assets of Barbados, which of course would understandably make someone raise a query, sir. Now, I have also heard in previous years and iterations that we should not fear lending nor securitizing on property within Barbados because you can't take it up and carry it away. I've heard that statement made. However, there have been examples where entities have resulted because of financing obligations in the increase of charges and tolls and responsibilities. So when persons raise queries, I think that the correct or maybe the ideal thing to do is to embrace them, engage in the dialogue, and certainly understand, as I was told by a colleague today, that the money is being borrowed for development. They're not borrowing the money to lick it out, Mr. President. They're borrowing the money to develop the roads in Scotland District. I don't think anyone will say that this project ought not to move forward. However, the same way it ought not to move forward in a mature democracy, in a nascent republic, I believe that if persons say, well, how is this being done, that while not coddling them, we certainly don't do a backhand, offhand remark that it ought not to raise a query, and it didn't raise a query prior. Sir, the fact is, China, as I would have indicated, is the biggest lender. So we're a good company. Currently, it's estimated, sir, that is $355 billion being loaned by the Chinese government, which is when compared to the $200 billion owed to Paris Club members and $300 billion owed to the World Bank. Those who have fear, sir, and I think is almost a derogatory term, I think it is derogatory, sir, like to refer to it as a debt trap. And they give the examples of the Sri Lankan port, of the Maldives development, sir, Angola and Pakistan. But these are places which borrowed billions of dollars. In this case, we are dealing with a loan of $250 million. 
I think that any fear with regard to debt trap in that regard will certainly be ill-founded. However, because we are so exposed to the media, because persons may not be as informed as to the potential risk or how normal this type of transaction is and the need for access to financing, we must be aware that comments will be made. Sir, as always, after giving the analysis and the perspective, it is simply this. The government is seeking to provide a means and a ways to fulfill an election promise as stated by my friend, Senator Paris. It certainly should be encouraged and be allowed to get on with these projects. And the question as to whether the ends justify the means, well, time will tell. The amount, sir, I don't think it's startling. I do not think it's frightening. I have some questions as to regard to what is the security, but what choice do we have in these present circumstances? What choice do we have? So I believe that the dialogue needs to be considered that it is coming from a genuine place, and the fact of the matter is that at the end of the day, somebody has to pay the piper. While we are cognizant of that, it is being done for development, and I therefore support the resolution. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Kevin Boyce. Senator, um, Senator Roberts Odom. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Considering the time, I promise that I shall be extremely brief. But I felt it important, considering all that has been said today and today as a whole, to make some very short points. Because as some of the other speakers have pointed out, there have been some concerns raised. There is absolutely no way around that. But there are some basic facts that have to be laid down. 256 million, 2% 2 interest, 20 years, five years grace. I believe, Mr. President, I think those are about the exact amount of the details I knew about my mortgage when I signed it. As my hand was shaking as I went across the page, as a child of, well, as someone who would have spent most years at the bottom of the economic ladder, anytime I see large numbers on a page, I start to get nervous, particularly if I have to sign on that page. So I can understand why some people would be concerned, because that for me makes me itch. It's a conversation that I have to have with myself repeatedly before I sign for the page. Am I sure? Am I sure? Because that is something that will generally make people itch, make them concerned. So I understand the concern. But the one thing I know, sir, I know that Barbadians are interested in seeing this country move forward, not necessarily for themselves, but not only for themselves in their everyday lives, but for all Barbadians. And one of the things that I heard by a previous, uh, a senator previously that stuck with me is that the people of the Scotland district have been dealing with the issues that they have been dealing with for 20 plus years. That is absolutely hard for you to tell someone who has waited 20 plus years for their issues to be addressed. Well, uh, you know, um, this making me a little nervous now, so you might go hold on for another 20 plus years. I know that Barbadians understand that this government does not fall its over itself to sign on dotted lines for large sums of money. We are Barbadians, that makes us itch. We're always concerned about it. And I understand that, but I also understand, and I know that no one in this or any other place is going to be willing to stand in front of me and tell me that Carlifa, who lives in an area where she has lived for in fear for most of her life, who was born in the Scotland district, who still lives in it, and who, by the grace of God, intends to die in the Scotland district. I know 
no one is going to attempt to tell me that Carlitha should continue to live in fear for another 20 years of her house slipping down the hill. I know that no one is going to tell Sheehan because Sheehan is a man who's very upset about the fact that in order to be able to preserve his life, he felt like he had to leave a home that was fully paid for and pay rent in Christchurch to ensure that his family is safe when he goes to sleep at night. I know no one is going to tell me in my face that those concerns should have to wait in the back burner. Because I know that we as a whole are concerned. The state of the world concerns me greatly. The state of things going up in the supermarket concerns me greatly. I guarantee you that when I was in there on Sunday, I had to take some photos of the prices on the shelf because I was flummoxed as to what was really going on. But I also know that I, like most Barbadians, respect each other and feel as though I'm concerned, but it has to be done. I am concerned, but Barbadians cannot be, continue to be allowed to live in fear merely because I am concerned. I know that when this government came to power, we were all mightily concerned and I know as we continue to see things change and we continue to see policies implemented that were for the betterment of better handling of our money, better common sense about what we did and how we did it, we started to feel a bit relieved. I know that COVID <laughs> and the three other major catastrophes which have happened to us in that time have all given us cause to clutch our pearls and Beg, but why? But could there? But are we, are we really, is this really something that we have to live through? And I know that every time I turn on my TV and I continue to watch the issues in Ukraine, it is an education and it is a horror movie all in the same breath. Because I had no idea how much things, how many things we used in Barbados came out of Ukraine. Absolutely no idea how a war on the other side of the world would affect my bottom line. So I understand. But the reality of the situation is Barbados continues along a path that this government has set for it. That we took every single rotten egg that we came and found and continued and continued, and still to this day, continue to find a way to make it work. Not just to make it work for now, but to continue to improve it. To continue to look for ways to minimize debt where we can. To continue to look for ways to take something called good debt. To take on things only that are for the betterment of Barbadians and Barbados. Because the reality of the situation is, I often think of Barbados like a household. There are standard bills every single month. Those bills are coming. So if the fridge stops working, as my good senator pointed out earlier, like some power ain't gonna tell me, all right, I'm gonna allow you this month. Checking next month. Water Authority isn't going to tell me that. My bills are, my regular bills are going to continue, but I still have to find a way to do what needs to be done because the food in that fridge still has to, to be able to be kept cold, and the people in this house still have to be fed. So I'm going to look for a method through which I can secure financing to get the appropriate appliance. That is all we are attempting to do, because these people cannot be asked to continue to hold strain. It is enough. I know that the people of White Hill can tell you it is enough now. We have reached the point now and I know that whether someone considers it political or not, the good operating for persons in this country to be able to live without fear and to live in good conditions is not just the business of the political, it is the business of every citizen of this country. So no one is going to sit, stand, or step me on the street and look me in my face and tell me 
that they don't understand the betterment for this, for this thing to happen, that they don't agree with and want better for other citizens of this country, because the countryside did not just get cut off. The countryside is not just an abstract place that we go every Sunday where we want to just <sighs> and breathe out. The people who live in the Scotland district are citizens of this country. They traverse all of the other roads, but when it comes to their own areas, when it comes to getting in and out of their home, when it comes to feeling safe in their own communities, they must, must be allowed to do the same thing the rest of Barbadians do, sir. So I will say this. I fully, completely, and utterly support the bill. I understand that Barbadians have concerns, and I know that this government will continue to make sure that it addresses those concerns as it can. Because the concerns of Barbadians are the business of this government. Please rest assured, we do not do this much talking, this much meeting, this much giving of information just for giggles. It is to make sure that Barbadians are getting as much information as they can. So I know that we will continue to give information as this project rolls out, sir. But on the point of this project, I want to stand and say on behalf of the people of Scotland District, I am exceedingly glad, I am exceedingly happy, because as one pointed out to me not too long ago, the light at the end of the tunnel was beginning to seem as though it was in a different tunnel. So I guarantee you that they are happy, sir, and that the rest of Barbadians, despite their concerns, I am sure will support this measure, sir. And with those few words, I am obliged. Thank you very much, Senator Robert Stoll. Senator, Mr. Maynard. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I will be very brief. Mr. President, I am exceptionally pleased to see Senator Walcott in the chamber. And I, I know, Mr. President, he want he wish to remind me, he wish to remind me that as a young man, I invested in a little property in St. John, <laughs> <laughs> and he inherited massive properties in St. Lucia. But we are different countries, Mr. President. I am pleased that this government has decided and is on the path of a comprehensive road program in that important part of our island. There are some roads, Mr. President, that I traverse in a, a sizable vehicle that have not been fixed in 30 years. And it hinders development. And it makes the life of people living in those villages really difficult. Because not even your bicycle can survive the humps and the bumps. But more importantly, Mr. President, if you have to come outside every morning and wait for a bus on half of a road that is falling away, it doesn't do a lot for you. Senator Brathwaite, Mr. President, I think he mentioned water. And our Scotland district has many, many streams that most people don't even know exist. They drive over them through the, over the culverts. And they are really important. And I hope that when this road rehabilitation program gets underway, that due consideration is given to not disrupting, Mr. President, or destroying our streams. Mr. President, during the last BLP administration, some extensive works were done in Springville. BLP, Barbados Labour Party. And it, it, it changed entirely the access from Welshman Hall down to Friendship Baxter's and St. Simon's. And even today, yeah, it's overgrown with some grass. It is there, and the road is 
absolutely stable. And I'm sure it was done at large costs. So if this money is spent, Mr. President, doing a similar quality of work, it will be well spent and it will serve this country well for a long time, Mr. President. I thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Mr. Miller. Senator Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I want to take the opportunity to express appreciation to all honorable senators who spoke, and I want to uh, respond to some of the queries that were raised uh, by each of the senators or the points that were made in a recommendation. Well, Senator Rogers uh, spoke about the benefits that will accrue in the same way that Senator Chantel, Senator Shanika roberts Odell also did, and the benefits, therefore, that would be derived by the residents of the area. I think that that is one thing on which we all can agree will be perhaps the most important impact or important outcome of this investment in our people, because that's really what this is ultimately, an investment in our people, in particular in this instance, our people who live and earn a living in the rural parts of this country. Senator Dr. Brathwaite, in his contribution, spoke in great detail about the importance of the rural areas and rural tourism and a contribution uh, to agriculture. I deliberately, Mr. President, even as the Minister with Responsibility for Tourism spoke only very briefly about ecotourism in the area because I did not want this to be treated to as something that was for anyone except the people of the Scotland District. I chose not to anchor my own comments as Minister of Tourism in the adva advantages of tourism for the sector, but of course I subscribe to the benefits that will be derived as a downstream benefit, of course, to tourism. And that in its own right, Mr. President, will also give economic benefits and commercial opportunities to the people who live and potentially can develop new businesses in the area. Now, Senator Harewood in his contribution spoke about the importance of um, development of skilled professionals, persons who can work in the construction industry in the area and people who can be developed. Mr. President, I was very pleased to be a part of a cabinet that just a few weeks ago announced publicly for all to see and all to hear the launch under the umbrella of the Ministry of, Envi of Education, Technical and Vocational Training, the Construction Gateway Project. This was a manifesto promise. It is again an instance of a Barbados Labour Party that makes promises and keeps those promises, Mr. President. We undertook to make the commitment, Mr. President, that in a ambitious capital works program that we envisaged over the next 10 years, that we felt, Mr. President, that whether it was in the area of house building, in the area of preparedness for disasters or resilience, or even in specialized skills, that there was a need for us to train thousands of Barbadians in artisanal skills and to allow those persons to then be the forerunners in the construction boom, including these kinds of construction works. And I am pleased that that project has started and has been launched. And I believe that it is running as we speak, Mr. President, with Barbadians having applied to and being a part of that project. In addition to the training, Mr. President, of artisanal workers in Barbados, which is for, for what is being described as the future construction boom, including all of these capital works projects, Mr. President, it does include the provision of startup equipment. It does provide provision for the provision for uh, financial literacy training so that they have the rudiments of how to start and run and maintain a business. It does include inclusion, it does also have reference, Mr. President, to the inclusion in construction projects which are being led by the government of Barbados, by this government of Barbados. And so I would risk to venture, Mr. President, that this is something that this administration anticipated, planned, and is already executing. Now, Senator Drake spoke about the importance of a communication package. Every major project executed by this government in this way has had an inbuilt communication project. There are also monies that are usually allocated for the retention of construction of communications professionals whose responsibility it is to ensure that people are kept 
aware of what is happening. In addition to that, Mr. President, every single member of parliament representing a constituency that falls within the Scotland district area has also been asked to ensure that one, they, kept, they are kept abreast with the Ministry of Transport and Works for the work that is being done, and that they use their constituency offices, their relationships with their constituents, their WhatsApp groups, their bulletins, all of that, so that you have the institutional PR communications being done by the project itself under the umbrella of the ministry, as well as the constituency representative. That is inbuilt into the project, Mr. President. I also want to make reference to the question about debt because, Mr. President, I think uh, Senator Roberts Odell raised it well. Barbadians are uncomfortable about debt. I am uncomfortable about debt. It's something that all of us are uncomfortable about when it comes to incurring additional responsibilities. And I think we also accept that there is no certainty about tomorrow. While we hope to be inspired for tomorrow, and we hope that tomorrow will come and it's a brighter tomorrow. I think that in 2019, Mr. President, when we came to office after having come to office in a way that you have described, Senator, Senator Drake, through you, Mr. President, after all of that activity into 2016 and what happened then in 2018 and having gone through that restructuring and you're thinking, yes, we're excited, we're ready to go, and then boom, by February 2020, the world had changed, Mr. President, and we thought, let's stay inside for a few weeks, and a few weeks turned into months, and it turned into two and a half years. So we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't have tomorrow planned, but we have to make sure that as a people, Barbadians especially now, understand that if tomorrow comes, and when tomorrow comes, we as a government have a responsibility to prepare for that tomorrow. We have a responsibility to mitigate against the risk of what could happen, but also to accept that there are those things which we could at best describe force majeure, and then we have no control over them, but we have to plan. If I was afraid of flying, Mr. President, but I wanted to get to New York, I'd have to be able to get some pills and I'd have to be able to do all the mitigation and I'd still get on that plane and I'd make sure that I can go. But I can't not go because I'm afraid of what could happen, because I just have to be able to do it and to put every single measure in place, Mr. President, to mitigate against a negative output. Now, on the question of the governing by Chinese law, my understanding is that, and I've seen a few contracts in the last two and a half years in, in, my, in my ministry, and, and each of these contracts, Mr. President, is submitted to the Office of the Solicitor General for extensive review. And in many instances, most contracts either fall under the laws of the country where the company is originating, or it falls under the laws of Barbados, depending on what the nature of the contract is. There's nothing extraordinary about the laws of China being the applicable notion here. It actually, in fact, most of us have banking relationships with commercial banks that are not based in Barbados, and they are governed by the laws of Canada, or anyone else for that matter. And this is no different, and I want to make sure that the public is able to put that in context. Then, Mr. President, I want to speak about what if. Now, Senator Drake spoke about whether or not we would be in a position if something happens, if the worst happens, and made the comparisons between what happened in 2016, the evolution from 2016 to 2018, where we are now, and what could happen in terms of recessionary conditions. Those things are all true. But aside from the debt, Mr. President, aside from our ability to repay the debt, there is also the reality, Mr. President, that at this time, in 2018, we made a commitment as a government to have Barbados restored to 15 weeks of import cover. We not only had the debt as at 2016, 2018, we not only had the debt to GDP ratio at 2016, but we also had depleted foreign reserves with very little import cover. We made a commitment in 2018 to return to 15 weeks of import cover. Today, as at 2022, Barbados has 39 weeks of import cover. That gives us an entirely different scenario when you put that into the mix. If tomorrow comes, what could happen? The, our Barbados' ability to respond is entirely different today than it had been then. And the final thing that I want to say is this, Mr. President. In the last parliament, 
this administration came under heavy, heavy fire for recruiting and retaining an economic advisory team. We pulled together a team of people with impeccable credentials from around the world on loan from some of the major institutions in some instances, and they were roundly vilified in this country. Mr. President, I would want to take this opportunity to say that where Barbados is now is a significant credit to the public officials who have worked on that team in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs. It is a significant credit as well, Mr. President, to the benefit of the development resources, but it is also a significant credit to the economic and the financial advisory team that this administration has been able to bring and keep on board in order to guide its fiscal affairs. Mr. President, I want in coming down the line to respond to, to Senator Boyce. I'm sorry that he has, run, he has spoken and run away without uh, having the benefit of a response. But you know the beauty of leading the debate on bills like this is that you kind of know what you will start with and what you will close with. And you consider if you will close with it based on what is said. So there was a door that was opened, Mr. President, that I wasn't sure if I was going to walk through. But Senator Boyce, having opened it, I am quite happy to walk through it. Mr. President, in 2016, the government of Barbados, very much so not under the Barbados Labor Party administration, the previous Democratic Labor Party administration, did borrow $170 million from the same bank. They did borrow it. Mr. President, at 2.5%, and so the argument could be easily made if someone wanted to, that, all right, well, when I said 2%, when it was 2.5% 2, 2 in 2017, what was the big deal? Mr. President, there is a provision within this loan agreement that this administration spent a lot of time navigating because of that 2017 loan, Mr. President. That 2016 loan under the Democratic Labor Party administration put Barbados in a position, and I want people to hear me clearly, where sovereign assets owned by the state were liable to be picked up and owned by a foreign entity if there was a default on the loan. I want to repeat myself. The 2016 loan of $170 million at USD at 2.5% provided for a port, an airport, anything to be picked up if there was a default. That was not done under the Barbados Labor Party. That was done under a previous administration in 2016. Whichever administration was in power, you would know then. This administration for this loan in 2022 has ensured that there is a clause which guarantees sovereign immunity for all state assets. And the assets, therefore, what is picked up here, Mr. President, and when Senator Boyce went down the road of talking about the lien against the, I was making sure I kept careful notes. I think those of you who know me know I'm always prepared. When he went down the line of speaking about general reserves and assets of Barbados and the charges to the Consolidated Fund, Mr. President, this loan is charged to the Consolidated Fund under the Barbados Labor Party administration because it is not charged to our ports or our airports and any of our sovereign assets as was done under the Democratic Labor Party. That is why it is charged to the Consolidated Fund. We have protected the people and the assets of this country from the things that we expect people to be concerned about, Mr. President. This is no fly-by-night government. We have not put together a fly-by-night team of people, Mr. President. So yes, open the door because we are happy as an administration to walk through it. <laughs> we are happy to draw the correlations that yes, on the Sam Lawrence project, we inherited a project, but we inherited a project that we will open, we expect, in December of this year. I believe we have meetings with Wyndham on Friday afternoon. But we walked through the door knowing that a previous administration, despite watching the news like all of the rest of we, 
and seeing what was happening in instances where state assets had not been protected in loan agreements, still signed in 2016 an agreement that did not exempt our state's resources. This administration has made sure and done just that. So there is no difference, there is no correlation, I should say, because there is a huge difference between what the government of Barbados as it was constituted in 2016 did and what this Barbados Labour Party has done in 2022 as it relates to this loan. And I am proud to be a member of an administration that ensures that the interests of the people of Barbados are protected even if we are in a scenario where we are unsure about what tomorrow will bring unsure about whether later on in the year there will be recessionary conditions, unsure about whether there will be another pandemic, God forbid, by the time we wake up tomorrow morning, unsure about what the growth trajectory is going to be, but we're going to put our best efforts into ensuring that it is an upward trajectory, but we make sure that that which we already own and that in which we have already invested, it remains belonging to the people of Barbados. <laughs> Mr. President, I want to assure Senator Maynard, that the springs will remain intact. Barbados will ensure through the various environmental agencies that the environmental assessments are done and that they are maintained. In fact, you would recall that in our manifesto as well, and is already beginning to be rolled out, I believe the Ministry of Environment uh, has already started a project along these lines uh, to maintain our gullies, our caves, I, I may have mentioned that before, but also to ensure that our natural waterways are also maintained and are protected. And I give the assurance on behalf of the government of Barbados that this project in the Scotland district area will be no different. Mr. President, in closing, I want to recognize the work, the advocacy work that has been done over an extended period of time by the members of parliament who have represented the Scotland district areas and the constituencies in the Scotland district area. Retired member of parliament for St. Andrew, Mr. George Payne, has been a voice in the wilderness for decades, crying out for the interests of the people of St. Andrew who have not benefited from any rehabilitative work or any restorative work for decades, perhaps for as long as the Barbados Labour Party has been in office in those areas. The Member of Parliament for St. Thomas, the Honourable Cynthia Ford, has also been crying out for an extended period of time for rehabilitative work to be done in St. Thomas. The sitting Member of Parliament for St. Joseph, the Honourable Attorney General, Mr. Dale Marshall, has also been crying out for rehabilitative work to be done also in that area. If you were to go up to St. John in the area that you mentioned earlier, St. John has had two prime ministers over the course of its lifespan and it has not benefited from any significant rehabilitative works. It has done so under this administration, under the leadership of the Member of Parliament now. <laughs> Mr. President, I am hopeful that tomorrow will come and it will be a brighter tomorrow. I am confident that even if it is not a brighter tomorrow, that the government of Barbados, of which I'm a member, will be able to mitigate whatever challenges come. I give the assurance that we will put our best efforts into ensuring that that will be the case, Mr. President. I look forward to working with the, all of the partners to be able to ensure that when the people of the Scotland district are able to benefit in the first instance from this rehabilitative work, that ultimately, after the fact, the people who visit us, those of us who are domestic tourists and those of us who come from internationally, will also be able to see the beauty of the Scotland district and the beauty of a rurally tra of a transformation, transformational exercise in the rural parishes of our country. And with these few words, Mr. President, I'm obliged to you and I beg to move that this resolution do now pass. Thank you, Senator Cummins. The question is that this resolution do not pass. Honorable Senators in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Have it. This resolution is no pass. Senator Cummins. Thank you, Mr. President. We are having an early evening. This brings us to the end of government business for the day. And I wish to adjourn. To, I beg to move that the Senate is adjourned. Sign a day.
question is that the Senate be no adjourned Senate day. All the senators in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. Missing the ayes have it. This sitting, the Senate is therefore now adjourned.